I'm an American art historian who's come here for 30 years and I had no idea the rich variety of art and unbelievably talented American artists that were here. And I'm so embarrassed. And the major American artists that came here over the course of the last 200 years. So I, it was a steep learning curve for me and I am still learning. Because every time I give a tour of the exhibition, people come and tell me more stories. And a lot of these stories are not written down. There are no articles or books about them. So I'm trying to collect them all and we can keep them. And, and I'm gonna share some with you. So I thought, okay, I have to get, um, I, I immerse myself in the collection, and the collection has some pretty amazing paintings, thanks to donors and thanks to the Friends, an organization of the NHA, people who pooled their resources, and when American Art About Nantucket comes up, they, um, they for an auction, they buy them or bid on them and buy them. So we have some really great stuff. But I said, James, I'd love to, and this was just the concept that came to me, I'd love to have half the works from the collection and then go out into the community and see what else is out there in private and public institutions and try and pair these things and see if I can come up with new stories about American art. I mean, this is just the idea. I had no idea if that would work or if I could find pairings or if I could tell new stories. So it is a miracle in some ways that this has happened. And I thought, you know, I was thinking yesterday how this came together. And one of the major reasons it came together is because we have such really generous collectors who let, opened their collections to me and let me have pretty much anything I wanted. If we didn't have that, this exhibition couldn't have happened. So thank you. I know a number of you are out there. Okay, so I started, I started with this portrait. This is a portrait of the um, Coffin Children, and it's in our collection. It's by James Hathaway, one of two major portrait painters in Nantucket working at the height of the whaling industry. And I, um, I had an awesome collector who said, Ann, I have the father of these children. And they used to hang together in my home 160 years ago. And you are welcome to have it. So I get, and I knew I had a show, I have to say, when I had uh, this. And they hadn't been together for 160 years or so. And this is the father by the same artist. James Hathaway, Henry Coffin. And this awesome collector said, by the way, I also have the grandfather. And they've never hung together. By the other major portrait painter on Nantucket in the 1840s and 18, 1800s, early 1800s, William Swain. So I have father, children, and grandfather. And, the, and uh, Henry Coffin is the son-in-law of uh, Levi Starbuck. And Levi Starbuck, Henry and his family lived on Main Street, and Levi Starbuck lived around the corner on Orange Street. So I have them all together with two of the major portrait, the major portrait painters on island. William Swain was, um, <coughs> He had the lion's share of portraits. He did them, and he did them for the adults. He didn't like doing the portraits of children. So Hathaway comes in, and he sort of fills the gap and does a lot of portraits of children. But he also did the father here, Henry, and um, apparently Henry paid James Hathaway $80 to do his portrait, this portrait of his children, and another portrait of the children that I don't have here to get today. But I challenge you, when we go into the galleries, to look at uh, these portraits all together and see if you can find f familial sim similarities. And ask yourself, are these actually familiar similarities or family similarities, or are they the conceit of the artist? Because the Hathaway, in particular, had a certain way of doing eyes and noses. So the question is, are, are the similarities the artists or the uh, family? But then look closely at William Swain's Levi and look at his sort of namesake, Levi Starbuck, there and see if you can see some similarities because there's some interest. And there's a wonderful little still life here of, I just love this painting so much, of the whale, of the ivory cane, and you get the sense of the hard shininess of the ivory with the hand, the softness and suppleness of the skin, and the thinning skin. I mean, this is a gorgeous portrait. You know, these children died early. Children, not these children didn't, but children died early at this time. And so these portraits of children were kind of to memorialize them just in case that happened. But I can tell you that happily, these both lived long, long lives. 
Okay, and then I, I guess I really knew I had a show. When this is what we have in our, we have this portrait of, by, of Captain Nathan Mantor, who was a sea captain, and then um, in 1818, and then as the whaling industry died, he became a captain of the steamboat, and he was a good, good friend of Eastman Johnson's. And my same collector said, Anne, you could have uh, the portrait, uh, the, the genre painting by Eastman Johnson that this guy inspired in my collection. So I could pair these two together, one from our collection and one from the private collection. Eastman Johnson is arguably the, the, the most accomplished genre painter of the late 19th century. And one thing he did, and he separated himself from the earlier genre painters in, in American history, art history, is he, his people, he gave his people kind of not a caricature, but a dignity, and they were often very absorbed in their work, and this really appealed to mid-century collectors. So there's an individuality and intensity to his, his, uh, his, 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 people, his people in his genre paintings in a way that like William Sidney Mount, he caricatured more of his country bumpkin style um, people in here. So when you get a chance, look closely at this image. It's a peddler, and this guy is, has come to sell his, this is not a good image, I'm sorry, there's not enough light here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's well lit in the galleries. So he's here selling his wares to this beautiful long, young girl, and pay close attention to the way Eastman Johnson did her, uh, her skin, because it's just luminous. And then all these wares here that he's trying to sell her. And look closely on that chair, because you'll see all kinds of textures, and there's a glint of silver. I challenge you to find the little silver box here. So what's interesting about Eastman Johnson and why he was especially popular, so many of his genre paintings have a nod to the past. There was a, oh, there was a frenzy of um, nostalgia for the colonial era, and Johnson craftily played into that. So you'll have, you'll have the, um, the Windsor chair from the colonial era, the, the uh, <coughs> pot-bellied stove from an earlier era, at the same time that he has a nod to rising consumerism in the more contemporary world. And there's really interesting tension in his works, as he does say. The friends of uh, the NHA pooled their resources and bought this awesome painting in May, in this May, May 2019. And this is William Trost Richards. And William Trost Richards is a well-known Hudson River School American pre-Raphaelite painter. And it's amazing now to have an awesome example from that school, which is a mid-19th century landscape school in our collection. But this is really significant because William Trost Richards uh, painted Right before he came to the end, this is 1865, the end of the Civil War. Right before he painted this painting in August 1865, he painted in a neglected corner of a wheat field. And this is, we can talk about this, this has all kinds of coded references to the Civil War. But my point in showing this was, he was used to painting large, large images of flora and fauna where you could spec you know, specifically identify what botanical name of what image, of what you know, um, vegetation was in it. And they were v highly detailed. And then he gets to Nantucket and he changes his aesthetic really dramatically. And you see Nantucket Shore here, 1865. People are debating up and down, and Jay Wilson, I'm sure you're on top of it, where this was, we don't know. But look at how he utterly simplified and really modernized the composition to three bands of sand, water, and sky. It's, it's really simplified. And my argument here is this is where he lands. He figures out on Nantucket the aesthetic that's going to make him famous and earn him a good bit of money later in life. Because this is what he starts to paint more seriously after he leaves Nantucket. And this is what he's most famous for. These big, gorgeous paintings of waves cresting on the Atlantic, on the Atlantic Beach in New Jersey and elsewhere. So here, it's just so art historically significant to have this now in our collection. Thank you, friends. So we now have a great example of Hudson River School American Pre-Raphaelite painters in the collection. And the friends also bought George Innes, back of um, Nichols Barn, 1883. George Innes, in 1883, was barely making any money. And just as he gets to Nantucket, he, um, he, he's a, he starts to make money. People are starting to buy his works. And um, by 1900, he becomes the most famous artist in the United States, which I had no idea. 
So back of Nichols Farms is 1883, and he's still painting somewhat like a Hudson River School painter, an American Preapulite. You can see the detail of the, the vegetation, the sheep, the wood. He's loading it with a lot of detail. But then in the same year, in the same summer, and I think in the same month, he paints this, which the friends also awesomely bought. Sconset Beach. And look at how radically different the aesthetic is from one to the other. Well, tonalism, and I'm going to, tonalism was hitting New York and the East Coast in a big way. And tonalism, um, <clears throat> the, the best proponent of tonalism that you would know would, is James McNeil Whistler, his nocturnes. So James McNeil Whistler is painting these very abstract, very modern canvases like George Innes's Sconset Beach, um, less detail, elegiac, pastoral, melancholy, and artists like, and they're selling like hotcakes. Everybody's talking about them. So George Innes and other American artists start to imitate, the, imitate his work because people are buying it. And this is what the robber barons in the Gilded Age are papering their, um, their walls with. So, so you see tonalism really coming into its own here with George Innes, and he is looking at the market carefully. And these are so, and they're just so radically different. Sconset, and I had no idea, nobody's written about this, this is an article or a little book in itself, was an artist considered an artist retreat in the 19th century. Abbott Thayer, which I had no idea, Dennis Bunker Miller, Theodore Robinson, George Innes, all came to Sconset to paint. And this is, nobody's written about it. And they came to visit a guy named Joe Evans, a painter who I have a whole lot more research to do on because I can't find too much about them. So they're all painting at the same time. However, I do not know if Thayer and Innes met, but they were painting in the same place at the same time. So more research to come. Abbott Henderson Thayer came to Nantucket in 1881, and he's best known for um, images like this. You know, this is the Stevenson Memorial, women, Madonnas, that kind of thing. He comes to Nantucket, and he starts to paint like this, in the same style as Innes and the tonalism. Here we go. And like, what's going on? Well, he came to Nantucket because he and his wife lost two infants consecutively back to back to premature death in 1880 and 1881. And his friend said, come on up, come to relax and um, figure things out. And he starts to, he doesn't paint too many landscapes, but he paints this. He ends up meeting, he and his wife aren't getting on so well, and he ends up meeting Emma Beach, who will become, on Nantucket, who will become his second wife. And they come back here in 1890 and marry. I didn't know this story either. But so he painted also in this tonalist style because he was looking to see what was selling and he was kind of imitating that as well. It's fun to see. And so he and Innes and uh, <coughs> Whistler all together. So James McNeil Whistler was exhibiting these kinds of things in New York in the 1880s and everybody was talking about them. And the artists uh, <coughs> imitated that. Okay. All right. So I think the thing that really got me when I got into this was learning about Elizabeth Rebecca Coffin, who I think is arguably the best 19th century Nantucket art, artist that Nantucket produced, and nobody knows much about her. She, she studied at Vassar, the Art Students League. She was a star pupil of Thomas Aikens at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. She, won, uh, she was born in Brooklyn of... Nantucket parents, and they're, they're, they go all the way back to the Coffins, Tristan Coffin, who was the first settler here. So she was very much, she was very connected to Nantucket and came here and lived here and lived the end of her life out here. But she started off in Brooklyn. <clears throat> she, I mean, her, <laughs> we, we have them now, they were up with other things. We have them well lit in this gallery. And only one book has been written about her, and it didn't ask all the questions that I'm asking. The, she, this portrait of the artist in conversation is the portrait of uh, Lizzie is her name, Lizzie. And she is in conversation with her model. You know what, I'm gonna hold up on that because I wanna go back. So she was a star pupil of Thomas Aikens. She was the first woman accepted at the Hague Academy in the Netherlands. And uh, that's where Eastman Johnson went as well. And Eastman Johnson's 26 years her elder. So she, 
she comes back home. She doesn't need money because her father is subsidizing her, and then he dies, and, and, and she has his money, so she never needs to sell works of art. But she's really ambitious, and she wants to do well, and she's keenly looking at what's selling in the, um, in the New York academies and who's winning prizes and all that, and she's looking carefully. Because look here, James McNeil Whistler is coming out again. Uh, this um, Symphony in White was exhibited at the Met in the 70s and 80s, and American artists just went gaga over Whistler's White Girl. And there's an uh, there's an exhibition out by a good friend of ours called at, Was Out uh, 10 years ago after Whistler, and it was a show about how all these well-known American artists imitated Whistler's White Girl with their own version of white. And I think that Elizabeth Rebecca Coffin was clearly looking at his White Girl as well in this gorgeous lovely image of the model. And nobody's talked about what's going on in the background here of this unfinished painting. I think it's a, it's a woman dancing with another, uh, with a man, and she's got a dance pose here. But this story is yet to be written. A whole lot more needs to be written about Elizabeth Rebecca Coffin in Nantucket. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons that nobody's writing about it is because she didn't sell her works. I think what happened was, and I have to get into it, she gave most of her works to family members or the Coffin School, which is about 200 yards from here. And they're still there. And they don't really lend their works. And they wouldn't lend to this exhibition, which was a big disappointment to me, because they have this unbelievable Thomas Aikens portrait of Lizzie Coffin here on the right that nobody knows about. And it's in their warehouse, and they wouldn't lend it to us. And it is startlingly beautiful. And look at how Thomas Aikens has rendered his pupil here in 1900 versus this is her own conception of herself in 1890. I'd love to write more about that and compare the two. And I really wanted them on the walls here, which was a disappointment. But this was so amazing. I got to see it briefly. Um, <clears throat> it reminded me of the lady in Harry Potter who flies out of the paintings. I can't remember her name, but she does. I mean, she's, kind of, she's intimidating. She's intelligent. It is so beautiful. And hopefully one day we'll get it. Hopefully. The other thing the Coffin School has is a whole host of Elizabeth Lizzie Coffin paintings where she lightened her palette. She was looking at what was selling in the 1890s and 1880s in, in New York, and it was a lot of French Barbizon lightened, lightened palettes um, imagers. And she's imitating that, and she does this. This is another gorgeous painting. It's large. It's called Seaweed Gatherers. And it's, in Mon it's, it's somewhere in Monomoy. And these are identifiable Nantucket folks. Uh, yet she's doing it in this French Barbizon style, and it's startlingly beautiful. And she lightened her palette, and I would have loved to have had the dark versus the light to see her looking at what was selling in her, as her uh, style evolved. Maybe someday we'll get them. <clears throat> so the other thing I knew nothing about was the artist colony that started on Nantucket in about 1920. Florence Lang was an art patron with some money, and she got a group of ladies and men together, and they renovated the whaling cottages on the wharf and turned them into artist studios and rented them to artists for affordable prices, and an art colony was born. And Frank Swift Chase, Chase was um, one of the major teachers there. And I, so I thought, okay, I don't have much space, and in fact, I don't ha know how many artworks I can put in there. So <laughs> I thought, I'm going to pick four, and uh, I'm going to pick four whose works represent different well-known mid-century American styles. Because while these artists' works have been exhibited, nobody put them in a broader art historical context. So I'm trying to do that at the same time that nothing's written about them. So it's been, um, it's been quite an education. So Emily Hoffmeyer is one of my favorites. And she was, she was a mathematics professor at Westchester, in Westchester. And she would come here every summer to to, um, to work with Frank Swift Chase and others. And I, um, this is in the Whaling Museum. This, this, and we reframed it, and it looks so awesome. And it's of the candle factory right here. And I compared it with a, with a private collector who was so generous to lend me this painting of Quinn Street. It was of his grandmother's house looking down Quinn Street towards Maine. And um, she was really clearly influenced by Edward Hopper and ur urban realism. 
So I just wanted to pair those, I thought. So make sure you look at, but she was clearly looking at Edward Hopper in her way. And there's a real wonderful push-pull in her paintings. There's that thick impasto paint that draws you in, but then there's this melancholy flattening and eeriness that pushes you back out. And so she was a good student of that. All right, then one of the, darl one of the probably the most impressive, most well-known uh, artists of the art colonies, Anne Ramsdale Congdon. And she is a, the collectors love her. And whenever her works come up for sale, people jump on them and their prices are going up and up and up. She, um, <clears throat> she, she started out painting and then she married, gave up her paintbrushes, and then only picked them back up at age 40 and comes back to Nantucket and paints, and she is an unbelievably talented painter, and especially since she started at 40. She, um, <clears throat> but the thing was, I couldn't find much information on her, and I had all these questions that none of the literature could answer, and in part because all of her journals, all of her letters, all of her things are in the basement of a family member who has just agreed, and I think the, the stuff is here now at the NHA, to have the NHA digitize them. So this is gonna be a great dissertation or book once we get into it, because her work is really lovely. And the style she's painting in is a regionalism, and it was the same style that artists from Massachusetts to Oregon, which is really interesting, from 1930 to 1945, painted in this sort of pastoral, agrarian, very anti-modern, very anti-urban, very anti-industrialization style. And you you can see it's so, has anybody written a book about that? This sort of regionalism, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know, there's so much more that can be done. But we'll look closely at her work, it is just gorgeous. Another artist I was really excited to learn about and I knew nothing about was Richard Haley Lieber, who comes to the U.S., He's aus, aus, he is um, Australian originally, he comes to the U.S. In, after being in Cornwall, working at the art colony in Cornwall in England, and he comes about 1910, 1912, and he paints in a variety of styles. He's very, so he starts out with modern, then he goes to post-impressionism, and then he goes back to modernism, and he dances between all these different styles. He was considered a darling of the, um, <coughs> a darling of the art critical Association. Critics loved his work from 1912 to 1940. Said he was the best thing going. He won all the major prizes at the National Academy and other places in, in um, New York City. And, uh, and then by 1945, he's sunk into obscurity. And he's only been a, um, revived recently in the last 25 years by critics and collectors. But I loved having this, this, uh, this is the one we have in our collection. You can see in the 1930s, he went back to Van Gogh and he was just jazzed up by Van Gogh and you can see the frenzied Van Gogh brushstroke here. But a collector let me borrow this one from 1913, which was in a really kind of early American modernism style. So it's really fun to compare the early and later works. I also should say that he won in 1936, he, he had a large painting called Nantucket, Nantucket War, and it won the major prize at the National Academy of Design and its whereabouts unknown. And I should also say that William Trust Richards that won, uh, did a painting called Foggy Nantucket, a big presentation painting that nobody can find either. Maybe these things will uh, show up in my lifetime. It'd be great. Okay, so I had to figure out how to end the show kind of quickly. And I was a little bit tired of the whole boat on the water thing. I mean, I know. And I love, I love the Moors. And thank goodness for the Artists Association, Courtney, thank you very much, because you guys lent us a couple of things that late, le allowed me to do a little kind of motif of the Moors. Isabel Hollister Tuttle uh, was another really awesome art colony Student, and I have Tucker Nuck Moore from our collection here, and I was able to pair it with her first teacher, Frank Swift Ch Chase. And I haven't talked much about Chase, and we can do that in conversation. But I do think that the, the girls, the women, really kind of superseded him ultimately. But you can, I want you to compare and contrast their very different version of the Moors, but you can see the influences, and you can see where, where he taught her and, and, and how they um, saw, saw, saw Nantucket in the same way in terms of color. Then I was able to pair her as she progresses and gets a whole lot more modern with her 
Next teacher, later teacher, Philip Hicken. And you can see how she is, he is influencing her to go more modern. And it's a pretty cool just vignette. I bring this one in. This is Robert Perrin. He's considered the ghost artist. And I was hoping that Kathleen Knight would be here because everything I tell you now about this artist, and this is a large piece, is not written down. I had to get it orally from Kathleen Knight, and it needs to be because this is just a spectacular piece. Robert Perrin was obsessed with, in the 80s, he was obsessed with ghosts. He was obsessed with overdevelopment of Nantucket. Sound familiar? He was uh, <clears throat> also obsessed with the Essex and the Whaling Museum. He came here all the time. So he conflated in this image of the whale's fluke um, the killing of the whales with the killing of Nantucket. And this is Kathleen. And in the... Uh, <coughs> In the flukes here, you can see, you'll see ghosts of the guys of the Essex, you know, up here, from, um, and, then, and their relatives. And you'll also see closely Robert Perrin's own family here. And then there's a whale tooth, but there's all so much to discover in that. So please, it's in the low light gallery. Look closely at it. Great, let me get on time. All right, I st I, I'm kind of ending with this, and this is where I should really begin, because this... This is uh, 1765. Susan Colesworthy was 12 years old, and it's a needlework that we have in our collection. It's one of 18 in existence. And people pointed it out to me, and I said, yeah, it's gorgeous, it's lushly colored, but I know nothing about it. How do I make it accessible to me? How do I make it accessible to the audience? And I was reading all the literature on it, and, and they talked about the colors and some of the motifs, but nobody talks Nobody talked about the main, main character here, the fishing lady. And I'm like, where did this fishing lady come from? Nobody knows. And the literature over the last 60 years, they just skirt right over it. And the thing about these 18 needleworks is they all have the fishing lady in her. So what is she about? Um, and I, I, I didn't know until two weeks before the exhibition opened. So um, I had a smart board member who said, I said, how am I going to make this understandable to the public? Um, and he said, well, why don't you pair it with uh, an another sampler done around the same time by another 12-year-old, this one on Nantucket and this one in Boston, which is quite interesting. So this is done by a 12-year-old on Nantucket, and this house is an actual house on Orange Street. And it is the very same house that Anne Ramsdale Congdon lived in 200 years later, which I loved having that. And, and all the motifs in the Boston fishing lady, because this came out, this was, sh Susan Colesworthy went to a school in Boston, a private school that cost a lot of money to go to, so her parents were fairly well, must have been well off. And that school clearly had engravings of famous paintings from France and Britain, because these motifs come out of many of these famous paintings. The house, all, and, and so they, they've been able to identify what those paintings are. But the fishing lady appears in none of these paintings. So where did she come from and why is she in there? Well, I got, somebody sent me an article two weeks before the show opened. And the fishing lady, and it was all about the fishing lady. And she is a metaphor for courtship. And it goes all the way back to Dun, Dun, John Donne's poetry. You know how we say, um, there are lots of fish in the sea, or that's a great catch. Well, that, that cliche goes all the way back to John Donne and poetry. And so this great author found um, images of the fishing lady on playing cards and ceramics and textiles. And there's one great one early on where you had a man with a fish a large fish coming right out of his crotch, and he's offering it to the woman with the fishing lady, and she's pointing her rod right at him. It was really body. They clean that up, because then the subsequent images were a lot more genteel. Because in the 18th century, courtship was changing, and the families didn't have the power they had before. Individual choice was coming into it, and the concept of love was coming into it, so it was a, somewhat of a fraught time. So the best thing about this piece that this 12-year-old picks, she picks the moment in the courtship when the woman has the power and the agency. And so this is so interesting. She, um, so he has offered his, hand, offered his hand in marriage to her. And the one time this lady was writing about in the courtship that the woman has agency is when he's offered her hand in marriage and she can say yay or nay. And it's not surprising she picks that moment because, look, she has a whole bucket of fish here. She's caught another. She has competency. Does she really need this guy? 
this woman, this 12-year-old girl, grows up, has a kid out of wedlock, and moves to Nantucket with her. Right? Wait, agency, does she really need a man? So, well, so I've been giving a bunch of tours, and I've learned something new every time. I gave a, a number of ladies a tour of this, and we spent some time talking about this. Fishing lady, and one of the ladies said, Anne, that looks Asian, that fishing lady picture. Look at the undulating blues. It looks like Chinese export porcelain. Look at the undulating blues. Look at the flattened background. And I'm like, absolutely right. And I brought, and so this is another area that we, we need to, to explore. And so I brought in a picture from the Boston Museum of Fine Art, a period room, about the same time that Susan Colesworthy would have been in her kind of wealthy home. And Chinese export porcelain would have been a big part of it. And, and you know, daily there. So she would have seen it. So I also think her teacher, so I think the teacher at the Boston School collected all these motifs from different paintings, but also included her own designs. And I think they, and she would also sell her own designs. So I think the, um, I think it's quite likely that Chinese export porcelain figured into it. It's right about there. And we can talk more about that. All right, I don't want to keep you any more than I will. And let's come back, and I can bring the slide, and we can talk more about the influence if possible. Thank you so much for a great audience.